What is going on, guys? Welcome to another fitness pain-free show. Today, we're going over when do rotator cuff tears fail after surgical repair. We are reviewing an article by Chona et al. Let's get rolling. So first and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You watching these videos, listening to the podcast is allowing me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a coach. I'm a personal trainer and a meathead. I love lifting weights. I love doing silly things in the gym. It's my passion, all right? This is the Fitness Pain-Free Show where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to training. If you are watching this on YouTube, please, please, please hit that like button. If you aren't already, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment. If you're listening to the podcast, please rate and review. And if you want to take that extra step and support me even more, please consider subscribing to my Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It is a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. So this is all of my most premium content, all right? I update it every single month and have been doing so for the past five or so years. So here's the thing. There's a lot in there. There's 100 plus webinars, ebooks, and complete guides. There's a private Facebook group to have all your questions answered by me. You have the opportunity to decide upcoming podcast topics. So if you want me to cover something in depth, I'll do that. And you can get started for just $1, okay? So if you head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs, and then click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders Online Library, there's an option to sign up for a week long for just $1. And afterwards, it's $9.99 per month. So super duper cheap, and it helps me out a ton, all right? Let's get moving. So why do we care about failure rates after rotator cuff repair? So first and foremost, and this is a little unfortunate, and it's it's worse for larger cuff tears, is that if you have a very large rotator cuff tear, so it's large or massive, you have a relatively high risk of re-tearing after you've had surgery. And I don't know that patients are always given this information by the surgeon, but if you look through some of the research we do have, 13 to 94% of large to massive rotator cuff tears at the one to two year follow-up mark have retorn, okay? And sometimes this is fully retorn, sometimes this is partial, all right? And I just I just really wanna make sure that patients know um, the severity of this situation. Obviously, you don't wanna scare your patients. But the other part is that let's do everything that we can in our power to make sure this heals as much as possible. And I think this is especially true in patients that really feel good. Um, I have had a handful of patients that have large or massive rotator cuff tears and in the first few visits, they're feeling phenomenal. So they're bringing their arms over their head. They're doing all sorts of stuff. I'm like, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Please stop. You're scaring me, okay? This is this is important that we don't go crazy in the beginning, right? Let's give yourself every possible opportunity to have this thing heal, all right? So we just really have to educate patients about that and uh, let them know what they can and what maybe they shouldn't be doing, right? And the other piece is that as physical therapists, it's good that we push exercise and we are conservative. That's That's an important thing. All right. However, at least in the rotator cuff, I feel pretty strongly that sometimes we need to refer to a surgeon in the case of large, especially large and massive rotator cuff tears, right? Uh, one of the problems with rotator cuff tears is that if you treat it conservatively, they usually do get a bit better. The problem is that larger tears continue to tear afterwards if you don't do surgery and they tear at a faster rate than smaller tears, right? And the other problem is that if you have a much larger tear, the retear rates after surgery are much greater. So if we're really waiting on a rotator cuff um, repair when we should have done an earlier intervention, earlier surgery, you may send that person, set that person up for a long-term worse outcome. Okay. And it's just important that you understand this. All right. So the other piece is the reason why we want to make sure that we understand these things is that we want to optimize our outcomes, right? So when is it safe to start pushing these patients after surgery? Is it the three-month mark? Is it the six-month mark? Is it 12 months, right? When is it most risky to do exercises, right? When is it most risky in general uh, after you have rotator cuff tear uh, repair? When should I be most concerned that this thing is going to re-tear? And also, um, and this might not be something that you're familiar with, but in the rotator cuff repair literature, for the majority of people that have their rotator cuff repaired, whether um, the rotator cuff tears again or doesn't, usually the outcomes are quite similar. All right. What you will see is, generally speaking, the folks that re-tear will maybe have lower strength numbers, but their pain levels as well as their functional outcomes are usually a little bit more similar. Okay. 
Now, in this article, they, they didn't find that. They actually found that at two years out, um, folks had worse outcomes if they retour, all right? But my thought is that, because the counter argument is like, well, if my rotator cuff gets repaired and it re my outcome is the same as if it doesn't retear, then why do I care? Well, for one, the majority of people that are having rotator cuff tear repairs generally aren't getting back to higher level stuff, all right? Uh, most of the folks I work with that get their rotator cuff repaired are trying to get back to a higher level, let's say weight training, Olympic weightlifting, CrossFit, all sorts of stuff. So I'm a little bit more concerned if they have a re-tear because I want to make sure that that rotator cuff is doing its job appropriately. And here's the other piece. We know that if you have a larger tear, it's going to progress a little faster than a partial tear. If I have a rotator cuff repair of a larger tear, and it re-tears or doesn't fully heal again, heal again, that's going to continue worsening over the course of time. So I would much, much rather have my rotator cuff tear heal and repair than not. All right. So a little introduction to the site. So um, they kind of mentioned the same thing I just spoke about. The retear rates of large and massive rotator cuff tears are quite high following surgery. And what they really wanted to try to look at was when are these tears occurring? Because if we understand when these tears are occurring, maybe it gives us information about why these tears are occurring, and maybe we can have better rehab protocols, better surgical techniques, so on and so forth, to optimize the outcome of the rotator cuff. Uh, what was kind of interesting is that this was the first study of its kind to look at this, right? And they're trying to figure out when do these tears occur. Their hypothesis was, or excuse me, their hypothesis was they thought the majority of tears would occur after three months, which, spoiler alert, it was the complete opposite of that, all right? And the other thing they mentioned was that if tears are occurring under three months, they think the reason for this is maybe mechanical failure. So maybe the surgical fixation just didn't work out very well. Right? So if a tear is occurring after three months, after six months, there may be a biological failure. So maybe the, the fixation actually worked out pretty well. It's just that the tissue just failed to heal over the course of time. Right. And like I said before, their hypothesis was completely wrong. The majority of tears definitely occurred before three months. And we'll chat about that uh, throughout the rest of this. So what are the methods in this study? So they had 22 subjects and the mean age was 62.7 years old. And I think that's probably important just because I do see younger individuals with large and massive rotator cuff tears, and they probably will have a little different retear rate. It's just that the majority of folks that do get these tears are usually older, right? And because of that, they probably have um, some comorbidities that maybe lead to worse outcomes. I don't know that for sure, but do keep in mind that it's going to be different for a younger person than an older person. So these folks had an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair of a large, and this meant more than three centimeters, and large is usually a single tendon, just a large tear, or massive, so that means greater than two tendons involved tears. These are all full thickness tears as opposed to the partials. They were degenerative tears, which did not, excuse me, did not improve with three months of therapy or home exercises, or it was a traumatic tear. So they didn't uh, exclude traumatic tears um, and only include degenerative tears or vice versa. So there may be a difference between the two types, right? If you have a degenerative tear that's maybe been retracted for a large period of time, it's developed something like fatty infiltrate within that area. There's a chance that that will re-tear after repair as opposed to a traumatic where that tissue is basically fresh. It just tore right off and then you put it right back on again, right? So who knows? That may uh, affect some of the outcomes here, right? Uh, all of the individuals in this study had a subacromial decompression with the cuff repair. Nine of these folks had a tenotomy. There's one distal clavicle excision and one tenotomy with the cuff repair. So they did diagnostic shoulder ultrasound examinations. So they didn't do MRIs. They did ultrasounds. And sometimes these are a little tougher to figure out exactly what's going on, right? It's maybe not the, the gold standard. But they did these ultrasound examinations at two days post-surgery, two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months after surgery. So I thought this was really cool. They had a pretty um, good interval in the beginning, and they extended out pretty far out. So two, two years is actually pretty good. And then a retear was defined as a definite full thickness defect was visualized. And I am not an ultrasound guy, so I'm not going to be able to give you good information on what this looked like, but that's what the study said. All right. So what are the results? 
So 41% of patients retour at the two-year mark. Uh, keep in mind that stat that I had at the very beginning. So somewhere between, I don't know, 13 and 94% or something of large and massive rotator cuff tears will re retear at the two-year mark. Only 41% of these folks did have a retear. But keep in mind, right, if you have a large or massive rotator cuff um, tear and there's a 50-50 shot of the surgery working, you know, that's, that's not the best odds. At least I don't think so. They utilize the Western Ontario Rotator Cuff Index scores uh, as an outcome measure to see how well the patients did over the course of time. And here's what's kind of interesting. Uh, the folks at Retour actually did a little worse on this outcome measure. And in prior research I've read, and the authors even mentioned this, uh, oftentimes the outcome measure is the same in long-term follow-up. That wasn't the case. These guys actually did a little worse on this Western Ontario Rotator Cuff Index when they Retour. Right. However, in the first two years, there was no difference <laughs> between the groups. But at the two year mark, there was a difference. Right. So, re tears post surgery, the large majority of tears occurred after three months. That's actually wrong. I, I wrote that wrong. So, <laughs> Or excuse me, under three months. I actually did that right. Oh, I apologize. So large majority of tears occurred before three months. And seven out of nine of those um, failures were before three months, right? So at the two-day mark, there were zero tears, okay? Everyone's cuff was still intact. However, at the two-week mark, two of those folks had a cuff tear, which is actually quite interesting because these folks were still in a sling at that point, which kind of goes to show you that Sometimes I, I don't know if, if maybe a patient does too much in the sling or maybe the, the rotator cuff repair just doesn't um, hold. Something goes on in that period of time, which causes that tear, right? That's a pretty big chunk of them in two weeks. At the six, six weeks mark, one more tour. At the three month mark, four tour, right? Which puts you at seven. And then by the six month mark, fully nine of those guys had torn, right? So there was two in two weeks. There was another one at the six-week mark. There was four at the three-month mark, and there was two more somewhere between the three and six-month mark. At the 12-month mark and the 24-month mark, there were no new tears. So basically, if it didn't tear in the first six months, it wasn't going to tear, all right? So how about tear size? Because if you do have re-tear, it doesn't mean that it tore the same amount, right? So four of nine tears progressed to the original preoperative tear size, right? So about 50% of those, it looked like they didn't have rotator cuff repair at all, right? And five of the nine were partially healed, right? So some of them will retach and then partially retear afterwards. And the average retear size was 45% of the original tear surface area. So about half of what tore came back off again, all right? And participants with partial retears, right? So the folks that didn't fully tear, they had a more favorable uh, outcome measure, the WORC score at 24 months, right? But do keep in mind, this it did not reach statistical significance. But the other thing to keep in mind is that the sample size is tiny, right? So it's probably not going to show sig uh, statistical significance because we just don't have enough people in the study. Right? So what are the conclusions of this study? Well, generally, uh, we, we kind of put them out there already. The majority of cuff tears occur less than three months, all right? So does this mean that you have a mechanical fixation issue? Well, based on what the authors define as a mechanical fixation issue, probably. So a large majority of folks are probably having some sort of issue uh, mechanically. So it's maybe it's not strong enough, so it ends up popping off, right? And the other deal is maybe for some folks, there's a biological healing issue. Maybe there's some too much going on from a rehab perspective. It's really tough to know, all right? So what are our clinical takeaways from this paper? So generally speaking, the most at-risk people are going to be under three months. So if you're under three months after rotator cuff repair of a larger massive rotator cuff tear, you're most at risk when you're three months or under, right? You're a little less at risk, somewhere between the three and six month mark. And then basically after you get after six months, you have the lowest risk. Basically in this study, there were no tears. If it was a larger study, maybe you'd find a couple, but at least in this study, there were none. So after six months, people were good. They didn't get more retears. So... Um, what do we do with this information, right? As a physical therapist that works with folks on a regular basis, you know, what does this actually tell me? Well, first and foremost, I think it tells me that I probably need to be cautious in the earlier months, especially somewhere between the zero to three month mark, right? So we know that the majority of tears are occurring then, so maybe I can be a little bit more cautious. So in terms of early versus delayed range of motion, because I delved into the literature a little bit to see if there's any difference in what a physical therapist would do or the rehab protocols to see if that would have an effect on whether or not these, uh, these tears re-tear uh, re after repair. 
So if you look at some of the studies on early versus delayed range of motion, so early would be somewhere between one and three weeks we start range of motion, as opposed to delayed range of motion, which is starting somewhere between four and six weeks. Um, there tends to be no difference in long-term outcomes for re right? Although this, this evidence is a little mixed, you're going to find a study here and there that shows if you start range of motion really quickly, you may have a higher risk of re -tear, okay? At least the study that I had, um, I think it was a systematic review, didn't show any difference. So how about accelerated versus conservative rehab? So in these studies, they maybe introduce a little bit more active range of motion and strength a little bit sooner. They're a little bit faster with their range of motion, right? And what you'll find for these studies is that if you start a patient off a little sooner with physical therapy, you're going to move them a little faster, maybe your protocol is a little less restricted, you're going to have better short-term outcomes, generally speaking, six months or less. And this includes better range of motion, reduced pain, and better outcome measures, right? So that, that's a little bit challenging because as a physical therapist, you want all those things, right? And, you know, if you've worked with a few rotator cuff repair patients, you know that it's, it's a tough rehab. They, they, they generally feel quite poor, right, pain-wise and also self-esteem-wise, right? They lose a lot of their ability to be a functional human being, especially an athlete. So if we can get them to feel better sooner, that's generally a bit better. So um, the problem is that it, it seems like there's no difference in later outcomes, right? So if I start someone faster versus sooner, it doesn't seem to make a big difference, at least at this study, which I think is another meta-analysis. You can go and check it. Uh, I'll leave the reference at the end of this for you to, to kind of read through yourself. And it seems like there's really no difference in whether I start a little faster or if I go a little bit slower with physical therapy, right? Um, and the last piece I really want to say is that some rotator cuff tears are just going to re-tear regardless of what you do. And a lot of these tears might actually be occurring outside of what goes on in physical therapy. So if we're in physical therapy, slow and controlled and very, very progressive over the course of time, and meanwhile, someone's at home using that arm when they shouldn't be or moving it too much in the sling, right? Sleeping on accidentally. I don't know. Um, you may find that some of those cuff tears are happening just by happenstance or because the patient is doing too much, right? So be prepared for that. If you have an individual that has a re-tear, it doesn't always mean that's your fault, right? I think we don't know why these things occur. At the end of the day, I think we wish we did, but we can probably be smart in terms of what we do uh, to decrease the likelihood of these happening, all right? So here are my key points and a little bit of what I maybe do. This is far from a comprehensive rotator cuff uh, protocol video. I just wanted to share a little bit of this information and maybe a little bit of stuff that you can take away that maybe help you out some. So what are the key points that you can do with your patients? Well, for one, I think you really have to educate your patients, right? And this happens even before patients go through a surgery. I'm educating people about things like retail rates and how it might be important to do this sooner than later, right? Don't extend it out too much, right? And then I want patients to really understand that they have to take their rehab seriously. Um, the retail rates are higher than we'd like them to be, and I don't want to scare patients, but I do want them to know how serious this is and how cautious we have to be, right? Because something that we do could potentially affect that retail, right? In terms of range of motion, um, I think the research is kind of showing us that if we do early range of motion, that's going to improve our short-term outcome. But if you look at one year or two years down the line, range of motion is pretty similar, right? So I don't really push range of motion aggressively over the course of time. If we're pretty stiff, I'm waiting, you know, to that three uh, month or greater mark to, to push it a little bit more. Not to say I'm not doing range of motion earlier, but I'm just being a little bit more cautious early on and I can be a little more aggressive later when there's less risk, right? Well, how about strength work? So generally speaking, we go nice and easy up until about three months or so. So the study kind of showed that somewhere between three and six months is when things get safer, right? And after six, it's, it's quite safe, at least for these guys, right? So I have a, a really slow ramp up of, let's say, passive and active assist range of motion and then active range of motion, then a little bit of resisted work. And by the time we get to that 12-week mark, I, I feel much more comfortable ramping up strength, Okay. Then when we get to the six-month mark, I feel more comfortable introducing heavier loading. And this is just because after that six-month mark, you're not finding people retearing as much, right? In this study, there were none, okay? And lastly, and this is not as relevant to this study, but generally speaking, for a lot of my kind of barbell athletes, fitness athletes, I'm not really um, feeling comfortable with them returning back to training, until about 9 to 12 months, right? And that's when we're introducing all the movements. So let's say if I'm an Olympic weightlifting athlete, that snatch is, is going to take a long time to come back. That muscle up for a CrossFitter is going to take a long time to get back. And even for the next 12 to 16 months, 
um, or excuse me, not next 12 to 16 months, but in that one year to one and a half year mark, I'm still having my athletes be cautious. And really for the rest of their life, they're just, they have to be smart about the way they train just so they don't re-injure this area. You know, you got injured for a reason. We have to think about why that happened. So we have to be cautious and smart about our training moving forward, right? So I have included the references here. Let me move my head out of the way here for a second. So there's the Chona et al. study. There's also the link to uh, early range of motion versus delayed range of motion to see how it has effect on long-term outcomes. And the last study is going to be uh, conservative versus delayed rehab to see if that has an effect on rotator cuff tears or outcomes over the course of time, right? So lastly, I just want to extend a very big thank you. Uh, I truly mean this. You guys listening to this and supporting me means everything to me, right? I love doing this and you supporting me allows me to continue doing this, all right? If you're watching this on YouTube, please, please, please give me a thumbs up. I'd love to hear your comments on this. What do you do with your rotator cuff patients? What have you seen over the course of time? If you haven't already, please subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast, please give me a positive rating and review. It helps a ton. If you want to take that next step and support me um, to the next level, I'll say, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library. Like I said, you have a $1 week-long trial, and then it's recurring monthly membership of $9.99. You'll be able to ask me questions for future podcasts, and there's a ton of learning in there. All right? Thank you very much, guys. I'll talk to you on the next one.